Okay, great. Uh, so uh, why don't we get started? Uh, there might still be, uh, I'm sure there'll still be a, a few folks coming in, uh, depending on uh, on how much uh, everyone is, is is running over from the previous Zoom meeting, um, I, I, yeah. So uh, it's a fantastic pleasure to to uh, uh, to welcome uh, Mark Bel Belmar to do a for our CADA seminar seminar today. Um, so let, let me tell you a, a bit about Mark's uh, past work. So uh, he received his PhD from uh, University of Alberta, uh, with uh, a, where he worked with with Michael Bowling. And uh, also, uh, uh, more importantly, where he developed the, the highly successful uh, arcade learning environment benchmark, which has basically led to to uh, all of the uh, all of the follow up work uh, using the Atari 20, 2600 games. Um, so uh, um, from twenty thirteen to twenty seventeen, he uh, he held the position of uh, research scientist at DeepMind in uh, London, and since uh, twenty seventeen, he is uh, at, he's now a research scientist at uh, Google Brain, where he leads the reinforcement learning uh, efforts at, uh, at at Google Research in Montreal, and he also holds a, a Canada CIFAR AI chair uh, at the uh, at Mila. Um, but yeah, so in addition to uh, to, to the uh, to a fantastic uh, impact with the arcade learning environment, um, he's also generally interested in, in representat representation learning for reinforcement learning. Uh, he's done some really interesting work on option discovery, uh, off policy reinforcement learning, and uh, and exploration in in reinforcement learning. And uh, yeah, so he, and uh, perhaps he's, he's also uh, Really well known as, as being the, the really the the driving force I think behind uh, distributional reinforcement learning, and so I, I believe that's the uh, the topic uh, of today's talk. And so uh, with that, I, I hand the floor to you, Mark. So uh, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much, and thank you for the great introduction. This is a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, and so without further ado, let me start. I'm assuming you can see my screen, so I'll, uh, I'll go in full mode. If you have any questions. Don't hesitate, you can interrupt me. I'll be happy to take them uh, and, uh, and discuss. I'll, I'll also be watching the, the chat uh, as well. So yeah, perfect. perfect. We can, great. Um, all right, so uh, it's a real treat to present this today. This is, uh, this is work indeed that we've been, we've been looking at for the last little while on distributional reinforcement learning. And I'll come to, to, to what that means in a little bit. Um, this is uh, what the talk is about today actually is uh, reviewing some of the work we've done and uh, an attempt to synthesize it into a coherent whole. So I should say this is a little bit of a pre, uh, a pre book tour in the sense that we're uh, in the process with my colleagues uh, Will Devney and Mark Rowland. We're in the process of writing something more complete about this topic. Uh, so it'd be great, uh, it'd be great once that's out. Uh, I'm hoping to have a reference that, that people can build on. Um, so let me get started by uh, actually just talking about reinforcement learning. And um, reinforcement learning is many things. Uh, but from my perspective, reinforcement learning is about the prediction and control of, uh, of sequential outcomes. So what do I mean by this? I mean, uh, it's about systems in which there's a sequence or, or temporal sequence of events. And uh, we want to predict what happens uh, in the future and uh, typically there's a decision-making component. And so either we might choose to fix those decisions uh, or we might choose to control these decisions to make, to make some choices to see which outcomes arise um, as part of these choices. Okay, so some classic examples of applications of reinforcement learning uh, are you know, ranging from, uh, from freight logistics to, uh, to controlling uh, energy grids to uh, controlling robots, of course, to do all kinds of interesting things, uh, to, playing, uh, to playing games. All right, and so some of the research that I've been involved in, uh, or some of my colleagues at Brain have been involved in, uh, is uh, in particular, as once mentioned, uh, the uh, Atari uh, video game playing. So this was the idea of playing um, Atari games. So Atari is actually a platform from the 1970s. So playing one of these games, from trial and error. Uh, and one major challenge in, in making decisions to, to play these games uh, in this space was a challenge of perception. Um, so this was actually a big deal in, in when, uh, when we applied uh, deep neural networks 
uh, at DeepMind to playing these games because it seemed like it was very difficult to, to know how to make the right decisions based on uh, what people have called raw perceptual inputs. Okay, so another kind of problem that uh, I think is fascinating is uh, the problem of chip design. So this is some work by colleagues at, uh, at Google Research uh, where they looked at uh, the idea of, uh, of basically applying reinforcement learning to, uh, to the problem of uh, laying out chips. So here the problem is combinatorics and it's surprising that reinforcement learning can have uh, indeed an impact in, uh, in dealing with combinatorics. Okay. Uh, Obviously, reinforcement learning is a natural, uh, goes hand in hand with, with robotics. And, and this is also an area that I haven't really worked in, but I'm quite excited about this idea of controlling real physical systems uh, from reinforcement learning. Uh, so what you're seeing here is actually uh, what's colloquially called the arm farm um, at, uh, at Google, that uh, where these arms were all individually tasked with picking out uh, objects from a bin. Okay. Um, and so last but not least, this is also work from colleagues at Google Research. Last but not least, I've also worked on uh, another game called Hanabi, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, Hanabi is a card game, a cooperative card game. Um, and uh, in this game, you're, you're tasked with making points by cooperating with your, your teammates, but there's actually quite a bit of partial information that prevents you from making this an easy task. Uh, so we also applied reinforcement learning in this context and uh, and worked quite well. And then there's new challenges that arise once you have to think about multi-agent systems, especially cooperative ones. Okay. So uh, the classic formalism for thinking about reinforcement learning is a mark of decision process. And that's almost always pictured by this cycle where there's an agent interacting with an environment. The agent starts in a state uh, and uh, from that state will choose an action to which the environment will reply with the reward and a next state. So that would be X, A, R, T, and X, T plus one, okay? And um, in, uh, in the language of random variables, we would say that there's a capital X zero uh, state, which is drawn from an initial, initial distribution. And uh, following this, then we draw an action AT from a policy, which is a probability distribution over actions. Then draw a reward function, a reward from the, from the reward function, uh, RT is a random variable corresponding to this, and then finally draw the next state, XT plus one, also a random variable. And um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to make a note here that uh, I've tried to make the notation consistent, um, but it turns out that sometimes notation gets in the way. So where it was easier to pick notation that is not completely accurate, but is easier to understand, I've made that choice. Uh, I apologize for the technical inaccuracies when they, when they come up. Uh, I like to think that bad notation keeps us on our toes and, and makes us think about the problem in different ways. So hopefully that's, uh, that'll be the same for you. So moving on uh, from this, here's a classic picture of a Markov decision process where each circle would be a state and the different arrows, the, the red arrows and the blue arrows would be the consequences of choosing one of two actions. Okay, so this is actually a fictitious uh, MDP describing a fictitious chronic disorder, right? Where the, there may be a patient who has either low or high morbidity. Uh, low morbidity is a more desirable state and uh, also has low or high tolerance to, to a treatment, uh, treatment B. Okay, so this would be the two state variables. And then the patient has access to two choices. They could also either go for treatment A, which has no side effects, uh, and is likely to keep the state as is, or, or go for treatment B, which has minor side effects, but has the advantage of uh, effectively reducing morbidity, except that it can create tolerance. And once the patient is tolerant to treatment B, then that is no longer the case. Okay, so uh, very, very fictitious example, very uh, uh, synthetic example, but it brings up an interesting point, which is now if we assign rewards to all of these states, for example, a high reward, a high negative reward for high morbidity and a small negative reward for, for side effects. Um, a natural question we might want to ask is should, in, if the patient has both low tolerance and low morbidity, should they take treatment A or treatment B? And how do we make that decision, right? So that in some sense is at the heart of reinforcement learning. How, what is the right decision in this context? Okay. Now the classic answer to this is to, uh, to think about expected return. Uh, the expected return is the, the expected sum of future discounted rewards, right? So that's what's within the right-hand side of the equation. And uh, almost everywhere in the literature, or in most places in the literature, we'll find that uh, to be optimal means to maximize the return, 
that we would receive an expectation thing of these objects as random variables, okay? Uh, if you're playing a game of Super Mario Brothers, what that means is you can imagine, for example, receiving small positive reward for collecting coins along the way and a large uh, positive reward for finishing the level. And again, you might want to, uh, to trade off these two things uh, accordingly, right? And it makes sense to think about maximizing expected return in this context. Now, if we go back to, uh, to this fictitious chronic disorder example, uh, there, it's not clear that expected return is the right approach to this problem. And what, this is what this talk is really about, is, is creating a, a language and tools to reason about outcomes, uh, especially from a perspective of decision making, that goes beyond, uh, beyond just expected values. Okay. And so, uh, really the key is to look at uh, the outcome, in this case, the sum of the return, so the sum of the random rewards, as a random variable itself, which I'm going to label as ZT, okay? Uh, this is not new in a sense. We know that this random variable exists. We can think about it. Uh, we did work in the past where we did Monte Carlo estimation. This is actually quite a uh, woefully inadequate re related work uh, slide. Um, and it's actually a well-known fact in planning as inference, right? So uh, we can think of the sum of the rewards and we can plan and reason about it. Um, so what distributional reinforcement learning is about, in some sense, is to think about that random variable and to, to ask, can we do all the interesting things we do for classical reinforcement learning, but with this random variable or its distribution? Okay. Uh, so just to get started, um, the, 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 the workhorse of reinforcement learning is the Bellman equation. In reinforcement learning, we say that the, we call the value of a state is basically the exactly that expected return, right? So the expectation of the random variable Z0, assuming that we start in state X, okay? Uh, so that would be the way to formalize this process. And uh, the key is that we have, Bellman, Bellman's equation tells us that the value at uh, that starting state X is in fact the related to the value of the next state by the Bellman equation. So the value of state X is the expected reward, the immediate expected reward, plus the discounted expected next state value, okay? So the conceptual uh, jump here is to go from a sum of random variables to uh, a sum of a immediate random variable, if you will, and uh, a future random variable. And what this gives us is uh, it allows us to basically break down the problem and make it computationally efficient, okay? And it, to make this happen, we really need two properties. So we need the transition dynamics to be Markov, which means that the next state doesn't depend on the history, just on the current state. And uh, implicit in this is that we need this, the policies that we uh, choose actions with to be sufficient. So policy is a way of behavior. Uh, it's actually denoted pi here in this equation, uh, as I mentioned before. And, um, and so we need that it's enough to deal with, uh, to, to deal with stationary policies. And I'll come back to this point in a bit. All right, so the, the starting point of the distributional journey is to, is to realize that there is an equivalent equation for random variables, okay? And here's the picture that uh, I think depicts this quite well. Um, you have a state X, and we're going to call Z pi of X the random variable that corresponds to the random returns, the random outcomes that you would receive from that state X. And uh, so in purple, you have that, the distribution of that random variable, right? And the distributional Bellman equation effectively will say the distribution of that random variable or that random variable itself is related to the random variables at the next step. So again, we can take the sum of random variables and break it down into a single step process. Okay. And so the, the, the equation itself looks like this. We say that the random variable z pi of x, which is the random return, is, uh, is equal in distribution to the random reward, which itself is a random variable, plus the discounted next state random uh, random return uh, sample at x prime. Okay, so there's a lot on this equation, so I'll try to unpack it a little bit better. This is what I have a pointer for. Um, so the, the, uh, this term here is the next state, x prime. It's a random variable because we draw a next state at random. And uh, capital A here is the random action we've taken 
In this case, note, I've removed the time indices because uh, this is what Bellman's equation give us, gives us. It lets us remove time indices, okay? And then, um, and then Z pi of X prime itself is also a random variable, okay? Now, the key to this equation is this uh, equality in distribution sign. And that's important because what the equation is saying is that the random return at a state X has the same distribution as the sum of two random variables, r plus uh, z pi x prime. It's not saying that the random variables themselves are equal. Um, and uh, the subtlety here is that um, we require effectively that different steps be independent, okay? Um, if this sounds fairly technical, it, it is, but it's also interesting because that's something that we wouldn't have to think about in the classical RL sense because expectations are linear and everything works out fine. Okay, but this is the important part. And now um, uh, a different way to think about this problem uh, that is maybe more, uh, more directly implementable is to actually look at the relationship between the distribution of these random variables. Okay, so this, you can think of this as the distributional form of the distributional Bellman equation. Uh, and what it says basically is that the, the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the random variables at pi x is related to the CDFs at the next time step. Um, this is quite a compact equation. The key here is that the sum of two random variables uh, becomes a convolution, which uh, when expressed as CDFs looks like an expectation with, the, uh, with a nested, uh, with one of the random variables inside the CDF of the other one. And then you can see that a discount factor actually divides the argument to the inner CDF. Um, so this is actually something that, that was known already in the literature uh, from, from prior to our work, uh, which is quite key to deriving some algorithms. Okay. Uh, all right, so hopefully that makes sense so far. Uh, so we have these random variables and we can relate their CDFs. And again, these are the random returns at different states, right? different random outcomes. Okay. Um, so, so far, this is all assuming that actions are sampled according to a fixed policy, which I just defined when I defined the MDP. Um, we can also think about, uh, as I said, controlling these outcomes. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, in the interest of time, but effectively, in the classical RL sense, when we think about control, we're going to replace the expectation over actions by a maximum over actions at the next time step. And that's the equation that you will see at the top of the screen here. Um, that's, uh, that's a fairly easy change in the classical case. We can also write the distributional optimality equation where what we're going to do is to replace pi uh, at, uh, where we're gonna replace pi by uh, an argmax. So we look at the, collection of distributions and we pick the one that has the highest, uh, the highest expectation. Um, now we can do this. Uh, it turns out that what we're doing, it, the reason why this is a little more complicated to, to, to write is because we can't just take a maximum between two distributions. That's not a really well-defined uh, process. Um, but it also shows that there's a choice. Given a distribution, we can choose which action we think is, let's say, the best one, right? And a classic choice would be to say, the best action is the one that maximizes expectations. But we could also choose something else. And so there's a choice rule here, and effectively, each of these choice rules is going to lead to a different uh, notion of optimality. Some of them are amenable to Bellman equations, some of them are not. Um, even in the context of the choice rule that's, uh, that's written here, the argmax, um, it might be that we no longer have a unique solution. Um, and so there's actually a very interesting number of questions in this space that uh, how to think of optimality once we actually have the full distributions at our disposal. Okay. All right, so uh, great. So this is the random return and the, the distributional Bellman equation. So what do we do with it? Um, well, just, just a few slides of analysis. How do we think about analyzing these objects? The classic object to analyze uh, random returns would be what we call the Bellman operator. Okay, and uh, the Bellman operator is simply saying, given any value function, right? The value function maps states to to, to expected returns. Um, we can transform it into a new value function by the application of this Bellman operator. Okay. 
okay? Where we take in the expected return and add it to the expected next state value, where now V might be an arbitrary value function. That's, that's really the only difference from the Bellman equation. Uh, what we know is that if we iteratively apply this operator, so we have the sequence of operations, we're going to converge to the value function V pi that denotes the expected return of that real random outcome. Okay, and the key is that it's a contraction mapping in, uh, in supremum norm, uh, which is sort of depicted by the picture on the uh, bottom right. So with each successive iterate, we get closer and closer to V pi. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. This is effectively the, the, the core abstract representation of a learning algorithm for learning V pi. Okay. Um, so we can actually talk about distributional dynamic program. Okay. So we have a random variable operator, which effectively takes in a collection of random variables and uh, outputs a new collection of random variables, right? And uh, it, it, it looks very much like the, uh, the equation because effectively all we're doing is replacing the right-hand side Z pi by Z. So replacing the true object by whatever guess we have about what this random variable should be, okay? Um, it turns out that the random variable operator is, is quite inconvenient to think about because of that little equality in distribution. Uh, and if you try to prove anything about it, you run into problems. Uh, so it's a bit easier to think about the distributional CDF operator, uh, which is very much the same. So we start with a collection of CDFs and then we can take these CDFs and effectively what we do is we, uh, we apply the operator to them and we get a new collection of CDFs. Okay. So, this is effectively, I'm calling it distributional dynamic programming because it truly is saying in a system where I have this recursive relationship, can I use the tools of dynamic programming to learn these distributions? Okay. Um, and so some very simple questions you can ask is, is this process going to converge? And if it does, will it converge to the, the thing that you were looking for? Okay. So, uh, just to give you a feel for this, and I'll take a step back in just a few slides, just to give you a feel for what does it mean to think about convergence. Now, this is the right audience for this. Um, there are many ways to compare probability distributions. You could, uh, you could use the KL divergence, okay, which is not the metric, but we can compare things with it. Uh, we could use a total variation distance, okay, the kolmogorov uh distance, the Pasha-Stein distance, uh, MMD, and so on. And uh, again, this is about distributional dynamic programming. If you have an approximation in the loop, then the choice matters. In some sense, the choice also matters for analysis. Um, and to give you a feel for this, you can think about uh, the following example that's at the bottom of the screen, right? If you're trying to talk about convergence in total variation, and I apologize if, if, if this is your field, this is going to be almost uh, very naive, but I think it's a useful example to think about. Um, suppose that I start at the right, this is the real line, and it's a very simple process where I have a single uh, distribution that is uh, centered at one, right? So it's a Dirac function at one. And my operator, the, the, op the, the operation I'm applying to that distribution is just to have the, the value of that uh, Dirac, okay? So when I apply T, I go from one to one half. You can think of it as a new distribution in slightly darker red, which is that uh, one half t. Okay, so uh, so then uh, we can do this, and then we could uh, repeat this process. And you can ask then, uh, at what point will we actually get to zero? And it's very clear that you won't, right? You'll you'll keep getting closer and closer without actually ever reaching zero. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that if you measure uh, distances in total variation, which basically measures the distance, the, the mass uh, where the two sets uh, disagree, the distance will always be one, okay? Um, and historically, actually, this was a big uh, uh, hang up in doing distributional uh, operations or, or studying distributional RL because uh, not all metrics worked, okay? So it turns out that, uh, that if you use the supremum p Wasserstein metric, um, then you can actually get convergence. And, um, and maybe I can explain this metric right away. So you have here uh, one of my best hand-drawn hand diagrams uh, describing to you the p Wasserstein metric, right? So you have two 
cumulative distribution functions, one of them in orange and one of them in purple, okay, f of z and f of y. And we're interested in measuring the distance between these two distributions. They're distributions in a real line, all right? Um, the p Wasserstein metrics uh, are effectively measuring the area between those two CDFs, okay? And the p term controls the, uh, the, exponent, the exponent that we use to measure the distance. So if p is equal to one, this is exactly the area. If p is equal to two, then we square the width, if you will, of these, uh, of these intervals so that we care more about wide distances than small distances, okay? Um, and so it's not too surprising that the, that the Wasserstein distance should be involved here because I've already presented to you the operator in terms of CDFs. And so there's a sort of close connection between the fact that uh, the operator operates over cumulative distribution functions and the fact that we have convergence in that metric. Um, without saying too much more about this, I think the key here is to get things technical. You really are dealing with a collection of distributions, one per state. And so we're going to have to define a metric over uh, these collections, which we call the Suprema metric or the Suprema P. Wasserstein metric. Uh, the good news is that we have uh, an operator that is a contraction mapping in P. Wasserstein distance. So I just want to take a step back here and, and sort of go over what we've just seen, right? We looked at uh, an operator that lets us take in a collection of predictions about the distributions of random returns. And what we find is that this operator effectively brings, uh, brings us closer to the true uh, random return, to its true distribution. Uh, and it's a contraction mapping, which means it does so fairly quickly. Okay. Um, all right, so that's exciting, but that's pretty abstract, right? And so the, the real question in some sense is, can we do anything with this? Can we, can we think of the, these, uh, these distributions and learn, learn about them? Uh, and one classic question we would ask in reinforcement learning is, well, can we learn them from samples? Okay. Uh, another classic question we would ask is, what if uh, we can't actually represent the distribution in closed form, or if it, there's no closed form, how would we do this, right? So for example, if we're thinking about the game of Go, the game of Go has 10 to the 170 uh, states, right? We can't possibly list a distribute list uh, all the distributions for all the possible states of the game of Go. So we have to do something with this. Okay. Um, all right. So in reinforcement learning, we have an answer for this, and uh, the classic algorithm is temporal difference learning. Uh, temporal difference learning is effectively the sample-based implementation, if, if you want to think of it this way, of the Bellman operator. We're going to start with a sample transition. So we have a state X that we care about, and we're going to draw, right? We have this random process. We're going to draw an action from our policy. We're going to draw a reward from our reward distribution. And we're going to draw a next state from our next state distribution. And then what TD learning does, is it stores, in this case, it's a tabular representation, it stores the value of each of these states in a vector V, and it effectively does, a, a, takes a step, right? It does a stochastic update with step size alpha uh, towards the, the target R plus gamma uh, V of next state, okay? So really, we are adjusting the prediction of the X to be more like the, the, the sample target that we've obtained from that sample transition. Uh, so that's a very classic algorithm that we know converges on the right conditions again to to the value function v pi. Um, at the bottom of the slide, I'm actually I'm actually bringing you this diagram that I think is, is such great work uh, that started in the mid '90s uh, by Schultz et al. and and and, and uh, Reed Montague and colleagues um, that basically uh, found evidence in uh, in the brain of temporal difference learning like behavior. Right. So effectively, when an animal receives a reward, there'll be a, a, positive, uh, a positive spike in, uh, in dopamine in the brain. Um, later in training, that spike disappears, but the spike will appear when uh, the condition stimulus, which predicts the reward, 
uh, appears. So the, the, it seems like from that evidence, it would seem that the, the animal, for example, is, is actually learning to use TD or is using TD to learn to predict the reward. So very exciting stuff. And I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. Okay. Um, all right. So this is TD learning. And this is a nice algorithm. So how would we implement this in a distributional setting? Um, and immediately, if you think about uh, doing distributional RL, uh, you have to make a choice. You have to choose how you represent your distribution. Okay. Uh, and so here's some choices, and I'll go through each of them in turn, right? We know that these random outcomes uh, are quite complicated, right? This is the sum this is a sum of inf an infinite sum of random variables that are discounted. Um, the random rewards themselves could be quite complicated. Right? So how can we represent them? Well, one way we could do it is we could have a, a set of particles. This is sort of a very nice and elegant approach. Uh, it has the downside that the support of the distribution will grow exponentially over time. So we have to do something about that. We could also represent them with moments. Uh, so learn the moments of a distribution, and that's actually probably the oldest approach in distributional reinforcement learning, but uh, that turns out to have its problems because moments really characterize what we care about in the distribution, uh, except maybe for the mean and the variance. Um, so two approaches that have actually been quite successful in the field are uh, what I'm going to call the categorical representation, which has uh, a fixed set of locations typically spanning the, the support, the range of the value function and uh, variable probabilities. So it's called categorical because we have a discrete set of atoms and we assign probabilities to these. Or it's sort of its transpose would be the quantile representation where we uh, allow the locations to move, but we fix the probabilities to be uniform. Okay, so these are different choices. Uh, and I'll explain to you how these choices translate into different consequences in just a moment. Okay, so suppose we've made a choice like this, then we can actually go ahead and implement a distributional TD algorithm. Uh, we go back to the CDF operator and we see that the CDF operator has an expectation so we can think of treating the inside of that expectation as a sample, just like we did with temporal difference learning. Okay. Um, all right. So that means that, yes, please. Um, there is a question from earlier on um, that wanted some clarification on the predi prediction aspects um, in terms of uh, their clarification was that reinforcement learning learns to control and the predictive aspect is not clear if you're talking about hybrid or model-based reinforcement learning. Can you elaborate a little bit? For sure. So does reinf was I, did I mean when I said prediction control, did I mean model-based or model-free or some sort of in-between? Is that correct? Um, I believe so. Okay. Uh, I meant it, uh, whatever choice of method you use, I think prediction and control would apply to both. Uh, so I, th I think the point I was making was not was not dependent on a specific choice of technique. Hopefully that uh, that helps. Um, are there any other questions while while uh, while we're here? I can't see you, so this is a there's always going to be a lag as I as I wait. Uh, don't hesitate. I, I don't see any hands or, or anything okay. else, so I think we're good. Excellent. Um, then please don't hesitate. I'll, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to, to answer. Uh, so just to sort of take a step back, uh, we, we looked at these representations and I was telling you that we might want to, uh, we want, we can think of, of uh, sampling uh, from, from the sampling, uh, implementing distributional TD effectively by looking at uh, sample CDFs. Um, so effectively, we can think of it as we sample a re reward, uh, an action, a reward, a next state. And that gives us enough to give us one single CDF that is well-defined and there's no expectation involved anymore. And then we can actually integrate the sample CDF into our learning or, or learn about it by doing first a mixture between these two CDFs with the step size alpha and then a projection step, but the projection step will bring us back to the set of things that our distribution can represent. Okay, and eta here would be the, the representation, if you will, of that, of that CDF. So let me, um, let me actually give you a picture, which I think will make this clearer. The way a distributional TD algorithm will operate is it starts by sampling a next state distribution and a sample rule. Okay, uh, that's in blue here at the top. 
Now, the first thing we do is we take this whole distribution and we scale it by a discount factor, gamma. So that, that has the effect of squashing the distribution and then elongating it because the mass, the probability mass has to remain constant. Okay. Having done this, then we, uh, we're gonna shift by the sample reward. So a convolution with the Dirac function effectively just shifts the whole distribution. Because we've committed to a specific way of representing the distribution, we now have to project back into our function class. Okay. And we can either do this before or after we mix, we mix in with the previous uh, distribution. Typically, the two operations will commute. The simplest way is to project into the function class and do a mixture update in this context. So uh, what you're seeing here actually, in fact, is a categorical representation where, we, where we've chosen to uh, have a fixed support, which is shown in blue and orange, and then uh, and variable probability, which are the height of the bars. Okay. So at the end of the day, we need to end up with bars that have the same width as the thing we started with. Okay. So uh, this is effectively a distributional TD algorithm. So what are the consequences of doing this? Uh, I want to just show you very briefly that there is actually a, a cost to approximation, unsurprisingly. So this is a very simple example of just a chain where we're trying to uh, in fact, there's no, there's no stochasticity in the system. We, you start in the orange state. And at the green state, at the end of this chain, there's a plus one. It's a deterministic distribution that just gives you a plus one. Okay. And so now what we do is we can look at, as we increase the length of that chain, and we do successive iterations of distributional TD or, or the distributional operator, what does our prediction look like? The dashed line is actually the true prediction, which is also, in this case, the expected value. In green, you have the histogram that is going to be learned by distributional team, okay, with a categorical distribution. And what you can see is this actually this diffusion effect that arises from successive uh, approximation. So we repeatedly apply the, the operator, actually uh, starting with one step and then going backwards. Um, and that results in this additional error. Okay. Now, the good news is, of course, as we increase the number of atoms in our representation, then we would expect a consistency result, and we do see it here. So with more atoms, then we will see less and less error in terms of the real distribution and uh, what we would see. Um, all right. So uh, maybe in due of time, I'll skip this slide, other than to say we've done quite a bit of exciting work in trying to characterize the nature of these approximation errors and when can you expect them and when can't you expect them. Delman closeness is one such way to think about these things. Um, and maybe of, of particular interest to this crowd, there's uh, an important point here, which is we're choosing to represent a distribution with parameters. Um, and it's tempting to think of these parameters as samples that at the next time step, I have a collection, I have a random variable that describes a collection of samples. We can actually craft these problems where the parameters describe, describe uh, the distribution, but they don't give you the samples directly. And you have to perform what, what's called an imputation step to recover a population so you can then learn from these samples. Uh, one such example is actually the expectile uh, parameterization of a distribution. If you're interested, it's actually work uh, with Mark Rowland uh, that uh, came out at AI stats last year. Okay. So, uh, I'll, so this concludes it for the math, if you will. Um, basically, we can write down similar algorithms to classical reinforcement learning algorithms in simple environments, simple systems, right? And so distributional TD and the distributional operator, and there's some snags along the way, but mostly it seems to work out. So now the real question is, of course, how do we apply these ideas in, uh, in complex environments where we don't have the luxury of enumerating or storing all the distributions. Okay. Uh, so before I actually tell you how we do this, I want to show you what happens when we do it. Okay. And so let me start with uh, an example from the, from the Atari suite. So this is a game called Space Invaders. Um, and in Space Invaders, you're, you're trying to uh, prevent the invaders from invading effectively. Okay? In the classic video game, you receive a small reward for, for, uh, for firing at an invader. And then, uh, in fact, there's a mothership that gives you more reward, but this is less relevant for this, for this point. And you, 
more importantly is you lose the game if you lose lives or you lose the game of the, if the invaders arrive at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so I'm going to start playing the video here. And uh, what you should see on the right hand side is the prediction made by a trained distributional RL algorithm as to what it expects its return. So the sum of the rewards to be. Uh, and so there's actually six graphs almost overlaid here, one for each action. Um, the bump is this diffusion process that I showed you earlier, right? So this is actually happening. There's an expected reward. Uh, there's some variance, but also there's a bump. And now you're going to see appear on the right-hand side a, 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 a mode at return zero. Okay. And this mode is actually the agent's prediction that it will completely lose the game. So there's really two possible scenarios here. We keep playing the game, in which case we keep receiving a certain reward at a certain rate, or we lose the game because we make the wrong choice, in which case game over, we receive no more reward. And what's exciting to me is that if you were just to predict the expected return in this context, you would not see this uh, appear in the system's prediction, which is give you a single scalar value. Uh, so this is the kind of thing you get if you predict distributions. And actually, this was the original finding in the, the 2017 paper, but this finding has been uh, reproduced by many of my co-authors and, and others in the field. This is actually uh, from Gabriel Barfman and Matt Hoffman at uh, DeepMind, where they applied this to the task of controlling this, this funny guy here, Majoko. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the value function, and you'll see it's the, 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 the agent is trying to go as fast as possible as it can. It receives a negative reward when it hits a wall, I think. And you can see whenever it's about to run past a wall, there's a bimodality that arises again. The system recognizes that it might succeed or might fail at this task. And this appears in the distributions, and this seems like a very powerful signal for learning. Okay. I'm going to show you a third example also from DeepMind here. This is by Melvin Cherry Canal. Uh, this is the problem of uh, peg insertion in robotics, which, uh, which is a fairly difficult problem where uh, we need fine grained control. Okay. And they actually use distributional reinforcement learning to, to, uh, to do this. Uh, so I just want to show you at the bottom right, you have a prediction. This is actually with a Gaussian representation and not a categorical distribution, uh, or mixture of Gaussian, rather, sorry. And again, they also found by modalities where when the system, often it's when the system is about to fail, it will predict uh, this event uh, independently. Okay. So uh, they also found that this actually made a big difference in practice for their purposes. So very exciting. Um, I'm not even going to spend much time on this because really to, to turn an agent into a distributional RL agent is, is pretty straightforward. You replace the prediction, classically a neural network now, right? You replace the value prediction by a distributional prediction. Uh, the only extra step is to choose the right loss. And uh, I don't have time to get into uh, this today, but effectively some, some losses are not amenable to stochastic gradient descent. And uh, this is a very interesting area of research, in fact, to understand what losses are both useful for learning and result in contraction mappings and also are stochastic. All right, so I showed you what happens. Uh, what's also interesting is not just the, these, these nice uh, artifacts, but in fact, we find across the board that using distributions improves performance. Okay. Uh, so this is actually taken from the Atari suite again across all the games. Uh, and there's many curves here, but in fact, in the bottom, bottom is gray, the baseline agent, DQN. And uh, you have it at top in dark blue, dark gray, you have cure DQN, which is a distributional agent, which uh, outperformed by quite a big margin. Um, so other type of learning agents. Uh, the x-axis here is training time, and the y-axis is performance, sort of classic way to report aggregate uh, reinforcement results. Okay. So same thing ha happens, I won't go too much into detail about this, but same thing has been seen in other domains, including the, the, the paper I was mentioning before in continuous control, in robotics, uh, also in Hanabi and multi-agents, a massive difference between distributional and distributional uh, versions. So we're seeing exciting empirical performance when we transform the value prediction to a distributional prediction, uh, even though we're still acting to maximize expected values. Okay? Um, and this is actually quite troubling. Um, and so, uh, historically, last year, actually, those two papers are published, we started digging into understanding why this works. And we found that, in theory, if we were to use distributional TD with a categorical representation and linear approximation, we should just do worse. 
not better, and there's no reason, no, no theoretical reason to support better performance. Uh, this was actually confirmed by Claire Lyle, uh, who did an internship with us uh, two years ago, where in simple environments um, with linear approximation, again, here it's comparing DQN, which is the, the, the value-based learner, and C51, which is the categorical learner. There's a third one, S51, which is also uh, distributional. Um, the, 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 the DQN learner in blue uh, learns faster and learns better than the distributional learner, which is what the theory says it should. Um, so this is pretty troubling. It's a pretty big gap in our understanding. Okay. And um, the way to show that this should happen is to do a very simple thought experiment, where imagine that you have the purple learner, which is learning value functions, and a red learner that's learning distributions. And if you assume that these two learners are equivalent in the sense that they output the same expectations. Um, if you can set up a system where after receiving a sample of transition, sample piece of experience, they're still equivalent. So they still predict the same values, the same expected values. Then we can call these two learners equivalent, right? They always predict the same expected values. This is actually, if you're familiar with this, this is a coupling argument. If two learners are equivalent, value and distributional, then effect, effectively there is no difference between the two. And uh, Claire Lyle's results are actually that many algorithms that we think uh, we use in practice in distributional RL are equivalent to a value-based learner. So a uh, massive mystery. Okay, well, it's not so much of a mystery in the sense that we've done some work to understand this. Um, and to come back to this, to these bimodal events that I was showing you before, I think it's worth reflecting on why are these, why is randomness occurring in a system? Atari is deterministic. Uh, robotics is not deterministic, but you know the dynamics you would expect are are mostly deterministic. Uh, Mujoko, which was the the continuous control domain I was showing, was also deterministic. But uh, even though they're deterministic, there is perceived randomness in the system. And for me, this is actually a really interesting line of uh, line of thought that because the system is using approximation, because there's partial observability, the, the eventual learning process looks like it's stochastic. Okay. Um, and so the key insight here is that predicting the return distributions actually leads us to a richer view, like I showed you before, of the environment, even though uh, in practice the real environment might, might be deterministic. Okay, so, um, We've actually done quite a bit of work on trying to understand why this might be useful, why distribution RL might be useful in neural nets context. Uh, and the tagline here is from Rich Sutton, prediction is representation. And the idea is that predicting these distributions because they give you this richer view in the world form what we call useful auxiliary tasks, right? Um, auxiliary tasks are the vitamins of reinforcement learning, of deep reinforcement learning. You predict them and then they help your learner learn better. And the idea is that a return distribution is a very useful vitamin. Okay. Uh, so we've looked at this from all angles, stability in terms of optimization, generalization, uh, anticipation, and uh, across the board, we actually find evidence of the value of these predictions. Okay. So I'm going to, to, to conclude now. I just want to talk about, come back to the, this, uh, this example at the beginning, this, uh, this fictitious uh, chronic disorder example. And um, I asked the question, how should we make decisions? Um, and in the classical setting, we, we'd say maximize expectations. And uh, to me, intuitively, the, the real answer should be uh, with caution. We want, in many cases, to make decisions that, uh, that acknowledge, for example, perceived randomness, uh, acknowledge the lack of data, and then account for these by dealing with the full distribution. Okay. Uh, so to make this point concrete, I actually want to show you another piece of work from some colleagues of mine at, at uh, Google Brain. Uh, this is actually a collaboration with Brain and X. Okay. And this is a robot learning to, uh, to pick, this is one of these, uh, these, these grippers, to pick items from a bin. Okay. Uh, and the task here was pretty, pretty simple. It's called, uh, it's from the QT opt uh, algorithm and QT opt data set, pick the object. Okay, and and the, the challenge is that all kinds of objects, uh, all kinds of objects are being, being given to the learner and they're, they have to do this from vision. And long story short, in this task also, the authors found that distributional RL improves performance. 
uh, on the right, on the left hand side, you actually have the, the prediction that the robot is making at different points in time. Um, but what they actually looked at is the idea of replacing the choice rule instead of choosing the action that has maximal expectation, um, choosing a choice rule that is more conservative. And you have a list of them uh, in the table here, CPW, WAN, norm, POW, and so on. Um, and this is actually, this is um, my favorite reinforcement learning metric ever. I don't know if it passes statistical muster, but it's a great metric. To compare the performance of these different systems, they actually measure the number of broken gripper fingers during training. And what they found is that the, the QT up uh, method, which is maximizing expectation, actually broke many more fingers than the conservative methods. Um, I don't know exactly what to make of this finding, except it's pretty cool. And I think there's something more to think about in this space. Okay. All right. So uh, this is basically the takeaway message here. I think, you know, beyond distributional or on distributional dynamic programming, uh, I think risk-sensitive decision-making remains surprisingly underutilized in machine learning. And I actually think that this, uh, as we scale up to real-world problems more and more, there are going to be many cases where maximizing expectation is not the right thing to do. Okay. So, um, so maybe to end on, a, on sort of a, an interesting note, actually, uh, just earlier this year, my, my colleague Will Dabney and actually Zeb uh, Kurt Nelson uh, had this paper in Nature where they look back at the uh, Volgan Schultz uh, data that showed the dopamine neurons encoded uh, temporal difference errors. And uh, uh, just a teaser, they actually found evidence that uh, these same neurons might in fact respond very much like what you would expect a distributional TD algorithm to, uh, to respond. Uh, so this is actually very exciting. Does the brain imp implement distributional RL? I think it's far too early to tell, but uh, it would make sense that in a context of a, a world where it may pay off to be risk averse or risk sensitive, uh, this might be a phenomenon we would find in the brain. So um, that actually concludes my talk, uh, hopefully with some time for questions. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, these are the many of the collaborators, some of the collaborators that have uh, contributed to this effort. If you're curious, we also have an open source uh, piece of code called dopamine that implements uh, a distributional RL algorithm, so you can take a look at that as well if you want uh, after the talk. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, many thanks, Mark. We've already got uh, a number of questions, and uh, I've got some questions as well. So uh, let's begin with uh, Madi. Are you, are you okay to ask your question now? Yeah, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mark, I wasn't sure if I understood correctly. Because you assume stationarity, right? And then you said moments don't do well, but, but they might be enough sufficient statistics, right? To just like reduce the dimensionality of the problem to like five moments and then just study the distribution of the moments in time, right? Why did you say it might not work well? That's a very good question. So um, it's clear, let's, like, let's look at the Gaussian approximation, for example. Uh, if you try to fit those bimodal phenomena that we saw in the data with a Gaussian, you wouldn't get very far, right? You would still get the mean and, and the variance, but it would be in the middle. Uh, this, is not my, you know, this is not my area of expertise, but I think actually before you get the right shape out of these distributions, you'll need a lot of moments. <laughs> and actually estimating higher moments is quite difficult. So there's a statistical estimation problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we've seen this in deep, in deep learning in a number of places where categorical, categorical representations work better because they, they capture a different aspect. Of course, there's a trade-off that's being made, but they capture a different aspect of distribution. All right, thank you. Thank you. Great, uh, uh, Kelvin, uh, you, you have a question. Uh, yeah. can, can you hear me? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we're good, yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. I think it's very exciting to see the new progress in the distributed uh, reinforcement learning. I uh, just have one question. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a bit more on why this algorithm works uh, in certain scenarios, but not in some other scenarios, such as cardboard? Because for me, I thought those environments are not that significantly different from each other. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I should have specified. Um, it's when combined with a neural network that we see the better empirical performance um, in the context of maximizing expected value. Um, so I'm looking for an answer which, is which isn't too technical. Basically, the details are in Claire Lyle's paper and also in those two papers. I'm happy to send them to you after the talk if you want. Um, 
here's the way to think about it. If you want to maximize expected value, you should learn about expected value. Uh, if instead you learn about the categorical distribution, um, and you have limited function approximation capacity, then you have to learn about other things about the distribution. For example, the variance in the mean. So you end up trading off, you end up making worse mistakes in predicting the expectation because you're forced to predict other quantities. So it's a, it's a function approximation trade-off. Uh, the same should be true for neural networks, but in practice, what we find is the optimization is, is, uh, is improved and then things work better. Okay, uh, so just to clarify, so the carpool is not done using a neural network, it's done by someone. That's right. Okay. So, so the, uh, well, we did both experiments. And in fact, if you use a neural network, then you find the same findings as you did in Atari. But okay. if you use uh, fixed features, then you find that it works worse. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, uh, Oliver, you, you have a question. Otherwise, I'll, I'll ask it. Let's see, Oliver. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll ask it. He, say, he says, uh, uh, regarding the randomness in deterministic systems, uh, could this be coming from the non the nonlinearity and links to chaos theory? He, uh, he doesn't have a mic, so so I'm asking. Yeah, him yeah. About that. Um, I don't know chaos theory well enough to answer that part of the question. Uh, maybe. Um, if by nonlinearity you mean that there is in general approximation, then yes, I think that is, that's exactly what's happening. Um, there's multiple effects, and uh, maybe I can bring the slide up again. Uh, Actually, I can't. I can't see. I can't see, and also share at the same time. So it's a little more dis distressing to speak. Um, let me try this. Um, where did I show it? Um, is it this slide? No. It was. There we go. Um, Part of the issue is an approximation error, but that's not a very interesting, that's not a very interesting case. Um, actually, maybe it is, right? If you're, it's related to state aliasing problem. If your neural network puts two states together that shouldn't be together, it's going to look like a, a stochastic system because you transition to, to a state that is now collecting two distributions that don't belong to them. So uh, through approximation, you can see uh, stochasticity arise. Hopefully that helps him a bit. Great, yeah. So I, I've I've also got uh, got uh, got a few questions. Um, so uh, I'm wondering, uh, don't we also need better density models for for the policy action space? Because it it seems it seems uh, somehow it seems unbalanced to to work with uh, stochastic policies that typically just output a Gaussian. Uh, whereas, okay, if, if you have all these richer distributions that you'd like to tap into, then then surely your the you know our action space models might might need to be richer as well. Any any thoughts on that? Um, yes, I think that's a that's a great idea. So actually, most of the work I've done is in uh, discrete action spaces. Um, but uh, I completely agree with you that it seems very strange to approximate policies with a Gaussian distribution. Um, seems like this is something that we should improve on. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, great. And then, and then I have maybe one more question just on the, uh, yeah, to, to get you to reflect on the, uh, that the arcade learning environment and where that's, uh, where that's taken the field. And uh, so, uh, you know, as, as Marshall McLuhan once said, you know, for, for first we build the tools and then they build us. Um, so, so yeah, given your experience with the, with the arcade learning environment, um, yeah, well, what do you think about the, the good and the bad uh, of, of how benchmarks are, are shaping the, the work that, that's being done in the RL community and uh, any blind spots that, that you think that might sure. exist? Um, this is great. This is the kind of questions I'm happy to answer on record. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, let me collect my thoughts and see where I can go with this. Um, <laughs> I, um, I think the, the 
the benchmark did something fundamental to reinforcement learning, which it, it forced us to uh, to rethink a little bit how how we think about uh, control. Actually, I think this is something that in robotics was already happening, but a lot of the RL research at the time was focused on grid worlds and, and much smaller environments and very synthetic and, and very discrete. Uh, and I think like any good benchmark, uh, the, the aggregate learning environment forced us to ask new questions or ask new questions of us really. Um, for example, if we had applied the distributional tools in the grid world context, we would have seen nothing interesting, right? And in fact, people had done this before and they hadn't really seen, well, why should I do this? They're maximizing expectation and everything works. This. So, so I think benchmarks are great for taking us out of our comfort zone, right? Um, and that's actually my favorite approach to research is to say, let's look at a problem that I don't know how to solve. And maybe the tools will not be the tools I know how to use, but then that's fine, I can go learn. Uh, this said, uh, I, I do feel like we have a lot of benchmarks nowadays and I don't know if they are challenging us uh, at equal levels. So I, I think, you know, the field is probably at the point of asking the question, what are the real unsolved questions? And, uh, you know, are these the right questions and how do we address these questions? I think that's actually something I'd love to see more progress on. Cool, uh, great. Yeah, okay, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, uh, uh, any other last questions? Um, okay, the, I, I, I have one more. Uh, so, uh, so a, a lot of uh, the, the learned policies are, are typically reactive. And so, so it, it's kind of a, a system one solution where, where you, you, know, you learn the policy that maps states to actions. And yet, uh, you know, to, 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 I guess, on, on more complex problems to do really well, you, 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 you do need to mix in some more planning uh, at runtime. So, so alpha go and alpha zero do that. And so, um, yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on, or do you have any strong, strong opinions on, on if and how reactive policies and planning should be combined or, or, or should complement each other? For sure. Um, I think reactive policies have been mostly a crutch that, uh, that was convenient in, uh, maybe it's a strong word, right? But they worked in domains where we had, the, they still work in domains where we have a simulator and we can, uh, we can basically offload the planning process to massive amounts of compute. Um, they work surprisingly well in that context. And I think that's something to, to recognize. But uh, I actually feel like in many domains of interest, um, we won't have the luxury, whether it's the compute or the data. And it's interesting to ask the question in this context, might we better be served by planning? If, if there's somehow, you use the word reactive, but I think actually what I would say the more problematic part of the policy is not the reactive part as much as the stationary part. All of these methods find stationary policies and that's assuming your world is fixed. And if I look outside my window, it's not a fixed world in any sort of shape or form. And so it doesn't make sense for me to think about reacting with a fixed reactive behavior constantly. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, great. Great. No, that uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, great. So I, I think uh, we're 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 at the end of the hour. So we should we should probably wrap up. I'd like to to uh, give Mark a, let's give Mark a, a thanks of, of of real applause and uh, let's see. I'll I'll add my own uh, virtual applause there. So <laughs> anyhow, uh, many thanks for. Um, for, for the time that you spent with us, Mark, and we uh, we really the next time we hope that you can uh, you can come in person. We would uh, love to see that. For sure. Thank you so much, so much for the invitation. Okay, our pleasure. Have a good day. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye.